gather here today to praise and glorify our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Today we gather to once again celebrate the faithfulness of our God and we know that His love endures forever, all seasons of life, and His promises remain unshaken. And as we begin this worship service, let us come together with hearts full of joy and gratitude for His unending grace. And let's celebrate the victories and blessings uh, He has given us. If you look at the back of your bulletin, we have some announcements. We have the uh, church council meeting today after the worship service. And uh, Veterans Day, uh, Baked Potato, luncheon at the museum. So uh, if you'd like to go, you can uh, go there after the service. And we have a bell, bell choir also after the church council. And we have an important, important prayer retreat um, next week from Thursday to Saturday, which uh, including me, myself, and other five members of the church will be going. Please pray for us for the safe travel and for that conference to be really spirit-filled place that um, we can really learn about prayers and come to really adopt that, um, the lessons here in our congregation. Uh, we'll take the registration until tomorrow, so uh, if you uh, would like to go, please uh, let Shala know. And, and, and that. Okay. And um, Tracy had always spends time throughout the week working on the finances of our church and you can pick up your contribution statements for this year and um, I want us to for us to remember uh, really that the offering is not just a financial transaction but it's an act of worship uh, it's like a barometer of our love and service to God just like it measures the atmospheric pressure so um, our offerings really reflect the spiritual atmosphere of our hearts. So look through the statements to see your spiritual barometer and according to your own standards uh, for the upcoming Thanksgiving and Christmas, I encourage you to give uh, to God as an act of worship. Um, I'm feeling a little bit unwell and sick, so I won't be shaking hands after the service. I know, you know, I would like to hug you, <laughs> shake hands, but um, I will greet you uh, with Warm smile. Okay. <laughs> so let's begin our worship service by standing as we're able to sing our centering song, He is Exalted, and we'll sing twice. <clears throat> before your presence today, we surrender ourselves to you. We recognize your sovereignty and your great power. Lord, we gather as a community of believers united in our faith and eager to experience the great things you have in store for us today. On this special past day, so as we reflect on the sacrifices made by our veterans, help us to appreciate the freedom we enjoy today. We lift up in prayer for those who are in uniform, risking their lives to protect the values we hold here. Most importantly, we are thankful for the freedom from sin that we experience through your boundless grace. Lord, today we come with open hearts, laying down our burdens, our worries, and our griefs. 
We trust that in this time of worship, your spirit will speak to our hearts, bring comfort to the broken, healing to the wounded, and hope to the discouraged. May your presence fill this place. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Please remain standing as you are able to sing our first hymn of How Firm a Foundation in 529, verses 1 and 5, if you're looking at the hymnal. their son Scott after a long battle with cancer not exactly sure of his age he's in his 40s I believe but uh, it's been a very long difficult battle for them if you'd please remember Patsy and Kenny Beatty thank you Curtis's brother Joe Lackey uh, has been in the hospital for two weeks and uh, with some pretty serious conditions, so we had asked you to add Joe Lackey to your prayer list. And many of you got a text from me this week. Mitzi finally found a, a doctor, and he is truly listening. She has a long battle and some very serious condition, but she, the answer to prayer is that she found a doctor that's listening. Amen. And then I want to say something. I gave the boys a, a bouquet last week for their uh, football. This little girl and Ava and Brooklyn, the second graders did a wonderful scarf routine, and Mila was in that too, and she was standing right in front of us, and we could see all three of these girls, 
at the Veterans Day program. The second, there were 96 second graders, and it, that was the best thing, wasn't it, TJ? That scarf routine was just wonderful. So, good job, girls. I spoke to Laura Adcock Monday, it was Monday, and uh, most of you, of course, know that his cancer is spread throughout his body in many places and he's on hospice. And uh, I asked her what to do about visitation and cards and things, and she said that it would probably be better when they return back home. Uh, and uh, I think she's handling about what she can handle right now. So please keep them in your prayers. They're really facing something. Thank you. I just want to thank everybody who's been praying for Alani. Uh, she's now three pounds and one ounce. And this is her diaper. <laughs> but she's doing great, and we really, really appreciate your prayers. Are there others? I'd like to report on the Turkey Blessing boxes. We officially have confirmed 65 families that we will be serving this year. And uh, we have been shopping and doing everything we can for the, the food. Um, today, after church, if anybody can help unload 65 bags of potatoes and apples, I would appreciate that. And uh, then Friday, we will be unloading the turkeys and the rest of the food about 3 o'clock. Um, if y'all can meet at the church about 3 on Friday, we'll unload the rest. And then 9 o'clock, we'll be meeting up here and dispersing all the boxes and delivering. So we need a couple of more people to volunteer to deliver. Um, we've got, I think, 18 people confirmed, but we'd like to go deliver in pairs. And I've got 10 groups, and you're, you'll be delivering anywhere from seven to eight families, and then the outliers, probably four families, because you're driving a little further. So we need probably a couple more people to, to volunteer for delivery, if you could do that. I what's, appreciate it. What's the date of delivery? 18th, Saturday. Saturday, okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, are there others? Okay, and you all, if you have a bulletin, there's a wonderful prayer list right here to keep, to make sure you keep in your prayers this week. Um, Israel. Uh, can always pray for our church and Pastor Jay. Um, even when he's feeling well, we need to keep him in our prayers as our uh, as our shepherd and the the one that teaches us uh, how we should be living. And make sure we pray for Wall Shaker's prayer retreat as well, because I believe they're leaving. He said they were leaving this weekend, so make sure we pray for them as well, and that that all goes well, and that they live. yes. I just wanted to report that Natalie is well and in the nursery today. Natalie is doing well and in the nursery today. Excellent. That is wonderful. Okay. If there are no others, no more, uh, no more joys and concerns, let us go before the Lord in prayer. Father, we come out before you this morning as the things of earth do go, grow strangely dim, as we come before your glory in your presence, Lord, that we cast all our cares upon you so that you may take care of them, Lord, as we can just glorify your name. Father, there are so many that are in need of your touch right now. Just They need your peace. They need your healing. They need your hope. They need your love. They, there's so many right now. You know the cries of our heart, Lord. Be with those that need you, and be with us as a church as we come together to worship you. Be with us as we go out as your church, as your hands and feet into the community to shine your light out into the world and let them know how much you love them and help bring your gospel to those that are lost and hurting. Father, we love to come before you and just say thank you. Thank you for being God. Thank you for being there for us. Thank you, Lord. 
and be with us as we come together as one body, as your body, to pray as you taught your disciples to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let us stand as you are able to sing our next hymn, My Life is in You, Lord. <laughs>
talk to people. Have you ever thought what it would be like if you could call God on the phone and he would be on the other line? I'm going to put, have you thought about that? Amazing. Amazing. And you call, well, we're going to kind of get into that. Uh, I'm going to pretend that I'm God and uh, someone's going to call me. So we'll see. See, maybe Charlie's going to call me. Waiting for my call. All right, let's see. Okay, I'm going to answer it. And I'm going to pretend it's Charlie. Okay, and so Charlie's talking to me. Okay, Charlie. Yes, okay, I'm listening. Okay, I've got it. Okay, thanks for, thanks for talking with me, Charlie. All right, talk to you later. Okay, goodbye. All right. Oh, well, got it. oh, it's Charlie again. All right, hi, Charlie. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. Didn't I just talk to you? Okay, yeah, I know you still got that. Okay, I got it. All right, I'm working. Okay, all right, we're good. All right, talk to you later, Charlie. All right, bye. Okay.
Guess who? It's Charlie. Okay, Charlie, it's the same problem you called three times. You're, you've called me all day. Can you not move on? I know, I know. Whatever, Charlie. All right, talk to you later. Now, does, would God do that if we called him? No. Does sometimes our family and friends do that? Yes. And they yes. say, move on, you've told me this. God doesn't do that. No matter how many times we, call, we can talk to God about the same problem, no matter how many times a day, God listens to us. Isn't that nice to know? And um, let's see if I have another call coming in. Oh, yes, I do. Okay, this time it's Sean. Sean, I'm not even taking your call. I am trying to save the world. I do not have time for you. Whatever. Leave a message on my phone. Now, would God do that? No, that's why we don't need them. We, exactly, we don't need them. God would never do that. We can talk. He's never too busy us. Um, God, we can call him any time, any day, any night. We can call him with any problem we have. He's never too busy. God never puts us on a hold, does he? And isn't that nice to know now? Do we, do we call God using our phone? How do we talk to God? How do we call God? Right, right. Oh. Okay, TJ, I am in the middle of a children's sermon. Really? Ah. Okay, uh, please accept that. DJ, good one though. That was an actual call, yes, because I was like, oh my gosh. Um, but now I'm back to being joking about God. But like we were saying, right, we pray, we can talk to God. I talk to God all the time, and you know, he's never too busy for me. He always answers, and even though how many times I call about the same thing, he always answers. Isn't it nice to know we have someone that's like that? Never, because even our parents sometimes can tell us, I'm busy right now, and they are, and our friends, hey, I got this going on, not God. He's our friend, and we can call on him any time of the day. Let's go ahead, and let's fold our hands, and uh, can you repeat the words, kids, after me? Um, Dear God, thank you for always being available for me. We know we can call you day and night, and you're always going to be there for us. We love you, in Jesus' name, amen. Okay, thank you, boys and girls. What a great joy it is to worship our great God this morning. Uh, let us take time to greet one another with a good, warm smile. And so wonderful to see you today. So great to worship with you this morning. So wonderful to see you. So great to see you. Today, as we are getting close to the completion of our study of Mark's Gospel, we are about to immerse ourselves in a powerful chapter of the Bible, a narrative that's filled with emotion, both heartbrokenness and, most importantly, unparalleled display of love. So would you please turn with me to Mark chapter 15, Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 15 in your Bible. Mark chapter 15. Here the pages unfold to reveal not just the suffering of Jesus, but the deepest manifestation of love the world has ever witnessed. In these verses, we confront the raw reality of Jesus' suffering, a story that reveals the profound pain of our Lord, willingly embraced for us. Last Sunday, we saw the scene of chapter 15 opened with Jesus handed over to Pilate, the Roman governor, and after enduring false accusations and an unjust trial by the chief priest. The crowd, manipulated by these priests, shouted for the release of a notorious criminal, Barabbas, 
instead of Jesus. The innocent one rejected by his own own, while a guilty man walks free. Then the physical suffering unfolded clearly in verses 15 to 20. Picture Jesus, scourged, lashes tearing at his flesh, a whip designed for brutality. Yet it doesn't stop there. In a twisted mockery of royalty, the Roman soldiers dressed him in a purple robe and a crown of thorns. Mockery, hit, spit, followed. But the suffering only intensified. Jesus carries his own cross to Golgotha, the place of his execution. But he's too weakened by the terrible, terrible affliction. There he is crucified, a method meant not only for extreme pain, but also for public humiliating shame. This wasn't just any physical affliction. It was a picture of deepest depths of our Lord's agony that even the highest heaven cannot contain. Yet he embraced this agony willingly, purely out of his love for us. The depth of Jesus' suffering, a depth we find it hard to understand, but one we must wrestle with to truly embrace the vastness of God's love for us. Martin Luther once wrote, The Son of God did not want to be seen and found in heaven. Therefore he descended from heaven into this humility and came to us in our flesh, laid himself into the womb of his mother and into the manger and went on to the cross. This was the ladder that he placed on earth so that we might ascend to God on it. This is the way we must take. What sinful man did to the Son of God can only make us weep. But also on the other hand, what the sinless Son of God did for us can only make us shout with joy for a Savior King who would suffer everything he suffered for you and for me. In today's study, I would like for us to think of three key words, and those are the darkness, the curtain, and the century on. The first key word is the darkness. As we journey through the accounts of Jesus' crucifixion, particularly in Mark and the other Gospels, a recurring theme develops, and that is the dynamic interplay between darkness and light. All four Gospels, writers intricately weave a narrative where crucial moments unfold under the cloak of darkness. Please look with me in your Bible in verse 33. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. Consider the unfolding sins, the betrayal, the trial before the Sanhedrin, all happened in the cover of night. But when Jesus was handed over to Pilate, as verse 1 of chapter 15 tells us, it was very early in the morning. It was Friday morning. And when we arrive at the very moment of Jesus' death, a strange phenomenon happens. It is noon, and even though it is the daylight, an unexplainable darkness descends. Verse 25, if you look at verse 25, it tells us that it was 9 o'clock in the morning when they crucified him. It was 9 o'clock in the morning. There he was hanging on the cross. Then from noon to 3 p.m., Precisely as Jesus was in the brink of death, an enveloping darkness covered the entire land. Some have tried to explain this darkness away with natural causes, like a solar eclipse. But a solar eclipse doesn't cast the land into absolute darkness for more than a few minutes. And you know, sometimes it only lasts for seconds. Plus, it can't happen during a full moon because Passover was always celebrated under the brilliance of full moon. So what was it then? What was it? This was a miracle of God. This darkness was supernatural. The darkness was caused by God the Father himself. In the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, the darkness that breaks out in the daytime is a clear cosmic sign of God's judgment and anger. 
For example, in Isaiah chapter 13, verse 9 to 10 says, See, the day of the Lord is coming, the day of judgment, the cruel day, with wrath and fierce anger, to make the land desolate and destroy the sinners within it. The stars of heaven and their constellations will not show their light. The rising sun will be darkened, and the moon will not give its light. Prophet Joel also said in chapter 2, verse 1 to 2, Let all who live in the land tremble, for the day of the Lord is coming. It is close at hand, a day of darkness and gloom, a day of clouds and blackness. And we, we remember the darkness over Egypt in Moses' time during the plagues. The ninth plague in Egypt was a three-day period of utter darkness. Then came the final judgment, the ultimate judgment of God, the death of the firstborn. So the severe judgment of God followed the darkness. So when this supernatural darkness shrouded the land here, we know now that God was here. God was acting in judgment. But the lingering question is this. Who was God judging? Who was God judging? The answer can be found in Jesus' painful cries in verse 34. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The full weight of Father's wrath was poured out on the Son of God. Moved by his perfect justice, God's infinite wrath was unleashed. The eternity of punishment poured out on the incarnate Son. The Son, being both infinite and eternal, absorbed the tortures of hell within the confines of finite time. The darkness said carefully, didn't mean God was absent. He was there. It was a clear sign of his divine and frightening presence. On Golgotha, the Father descended in judgment, shrouded in darkness, playing the role of a divine executioner. But God didn't come to Calvary to protect his son from sinners. His anger wasn't directed at sinners, but at the one carrying the burden of sins. Now think about the darkness for a moment. We probably have in a cave, or the room where it's dark when the lights are turned out. It's a quiet experience, the kind of darkness that you can't see anything. So dark that you can't even see your hand. And this type of darkness we experience in everyday life is a bit like our spiritual condition. The Bible says we are spiritually born with a natural inclination to pursue our own desires, carving out a path that often leads us to live independently, apart from the guiding presence of our Creator. Our spiritual condition is, is like that of a state of isolation. The darkness comes when we turn away from God, who is our true light, and when we let other things take the most important places in our lives. When God is the most important thing in your life, everything else shines with truth and life. Your journey becomes bright with God's light, and your life has meaning and purpose. But if you decide to turn away from God, making other things the most important, a dark shadow covers your soul. And when you finally get those things you were chasing after and really wanted, you realize they can't really light up the big part of your soul. They can't shine on their own. And they cannot satisfy our emptiness. This is the spiritual darkness that we face. Turning away from God and putting anything else above Him leads from feeling lost to falling apart. Unless God steps in, we're all at risk of getting lost in the darkness. We'll end up keep chasing and going around things that can't really shine their own light. Our journey was set in that particular direction, and Jesus' death was the only way to alter the course. This is why Jesus had to go to the cross. He fell into that complete darkness for which we were headed. 
He died the death we should have died so that we can be saved from the, this dark, darkness. And he said, live in the light and presence of God. Peter makes what happened very clear. In 1 Peter chapter 2, 24, he said, he himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, you have been saved. So now the radiance of God's love guide us on a new trajectory. The shadow of sin no longer have dominion over us. It's that we find ourselves embraced by the light of the grace that emanates from our Lord's sacrificial death on the cross. The second key word is the curtain. Curtain. Please look with me in your Bible in verses 37 to 38. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. The curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. Remember that the curtain in the temple was not just a thin little veil. It was heavy and thick almost as substantial as a wall. In the tabernacle and later in the temple, all of the Israelites were allowed into the courtyard, the first level of holiness. Then only Levitical priests were allowed, to in, allowed into the first room, which is the holy place in your sin. And finally, only the one high priest could enter into the second room, behind the curtain, the holy of holies, the most holy place, just once a year, and the Holy of Holies was covered by this thick curtain because inside there was the Ark of the Covenant where there was the glory of God. The very brilliance of presence of God would manifest there. So it was also a place of great danger because anyone who sees the glory of God would die at a spot instantly. Even in Leviticus chapter 16, God instructs that when high priest enters into the most holy place, it needed to offer plenty of incense and created a cloud of smoke to cover the glory of God. The high priest entered here only once a year on the Day of Atonement to make atonement for the sins of the whole nation. It was a serious task, and the high priest had to approach God's glory with great care, following his instructions closely and precisely to make sure safety and fulfill the important role of atoning for the sins of the people. So just a week before the day of atonement, the high priest would be taken away from his home and placed in isolation all alone. And he was to ensure that he wouldn't accidentally come into contact with anything unclean. Clean food would be provided to him and he would cleanse his body and prepare his heart. The night before the day, he wouldn't sleep. Instead, he would stay up all night, engaged in prayer, reading of God's word to purify his soul. Then on that great day, the high priest would take a thorough bath, cleansing himself from head to toe inside the courtyard, and then dressed in pure, untainted white linen. Then with utmost reverence, he would enter the Holy of Holies a sprinkle of blood of an animal offered to God to atone for the sins, his own sin first. Then afterward, he would come out and cleanse himself once again with a complete bath again from head to toe and be dressed in a brand new set of a pure linen garment. Then with great humility, he would enter the Holy of Holies once again, this time carrying the weight of the sins of all the people upon his shoulders, seeking atonement on the people's behalf. And all of this took place in full view of, view of the public. The tabernacle would be packed with people, eagerly observing every step. The people were there, witnessing his cleansing, his dressing, his entry into the Holy of Holies, and his coming out to wash again. They understood that he acted as their representative before God, and they wholeheartedly prayed for him. Their utmost concern was to make sure that every action was carried out correctly and with the highest purity because he was standing before the presence of God. 
on their behalf. So for centuries, a curtain separated the people from the Holy of Holies, the sacred dwelling place of God. And this separation, this barrier, was a constant reminder of people's distance from the holiness of God. The curtain, like an impenetrable wall, stood as a solemn reminder of their sin that kept them from drawing near to the throne of God. But in that crucial moment, when Jesus gave his life on the cross, something amazing happened. The huge curtain that covered the Holy of Holies was torn into two pieces. It went from the very top to the very bottom as if God was making a big announcement. It was God saying loud and clear through the skies and the earth, look, this is the sacrifice that ends all sacrifices. And now the way to me is wide open. No animal sacrifice would tear open the curtain. No ritual had the power to tear open the barrier. But on that historic Friday afternoon, the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, has offered one and ultimate sacrifice and tore down the barrier that stood before, between humanity and God's presence. The curtain was no longer a symbol of separation, but it was now a symbol of the completed work of Christ. We were the ones who felt completely separated and cut off from God, daring to approach His presence. But Jesus took this separation on Himself. When Jesus cried, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why have you abandoned me? It wasn't merely about physical pain or the fear of death. No, this cry emerged from a deeper sense from the heart of the Son of God, sensing a profound separation and being left alone by God. Just consider the gravity of this separation. This loss was between the Father and the Son, who had loved each other from all eternity. This love was going on for eternity, forever, perfect in every way. And Jesus was losing it. He was somehow slipping out of it. Somehow he was being cut off from this love. Jesus suffered our separation so that we might be brought back to God. Will you say amen? amen. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And the answer to the question is this. For you and for me was for us. Jesus willingly felt separation by God so that we would never have to feel in ourselves. The judgment that was supposed to be for us found its place on Jesus. Lastly, let's look at our third keyword, the centrium. Let's look at him in your Bible in verse 39. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the Son of God. It was a confession that acknowledging the deity of Jesus Christ, him being the divine God. This was truly the Son of God. And what makes this confession even more amazing is that for the first time, very first time in the whole Gospel of Mark, this is the very first time that a human being made the confession. Up to this point, no human being had figured that out. Even the disciples. Disciples had called him the Christ, the Messiah. But as we studied in the culture of the time, the Christ or the Messiah was not seen as God, as divine. During all of Jesus' teachings and amazing actions, calming storms, healing sicknesses, even overcoming death with his powerful words, there were clear signs that he was more than just a regular person. People were curious, asking, who is this man? 
But the first person to really get it was this Gentile Roman centurion. Truly, this man was the Son of God. This is all the more surprising because he was Roman. Not only Roman, but he was a high-ranking official who climbed the ladder to get, get to that. Every Roman coin at the time proclaimed Tiberius Caesar, son of the divine Augustus. The only personal loyal Roman would typically call son of God was Caesar. But this man assigned the title to Jesus. And this Roman century had encountered many deaths, both witnessing and causing it to a degree beyond our comprehension. He was a tough and ruthless individual. Yet, something had broken through his spiritual darkness. And he became the first person to acknowledge Christ's divine nature. He's been to many battles. And despite witnessing countless deaths, even many caused by his own hand, this death of Jesus was different for the century. There's something about Jesus' death that stood out. The tenderness of Jesus, even in the darkest hour. The gentleness of Jesus, even in the midst of terrifying hour somehow penetrated the centurion's tough heart. Even in the darkest hours, Jesus showed a beauty in his death that brought light to the centurion's darkness. Of course, this is not a human attainment, but the gift of God. And when the curtain was torn in half, when the barrier separating people from God was gone forever, God's presence burst forth from the innermost part of the temple. And in that moment, God embraced even this Gentile Roman centurion. At the climax of the story, a centurion who has seen no miracles in the past, but sees only the crucified Jesus, sees who he really is. And he is the model and example for all of us. Those of us who also have not seen his miracles in the past. Walk with his disciples. But we see for who he really is. He's the living son of divine God. Amen? Just like the century and Mark, the one telling this story, wants all of us who are reading it to say, Jesus is truly the Son of God. It's a big question, and <coughs> only you can answer it. Have you confessed to Jesus as your personal Savior? Even beyond that, is He your God that you come here to worship? Is He, is he the essence of eternal God Himself, the Son of God? It's a choice each person has to make. No one can make that choice for you. And in my time with you here, I'm praying that God's presence will burst forth from that holy place, breaking through the barriers, touching your heart, so that you can truly see who Jesus is. That Jesus Christ is the eternal God we worship, God the Son, who came to die for you and me. Until the very last moment when I'm with you here, that's the confession. I sincerely hope to hear from each person in our congregation. And as ministers of the gospel, we can all invite others to Christ and to the Holy of Holies to experience the worship of our great God and a new and liberated life. That's not just my job, not just the responsibility of the pastor, but the job of all of us, inviting everyone to come close to the throne of God because the curtain is gone because now everyone can experience his love and grace. Christianity stands alone among many religions by saying that God himself experienced suffering, even trying, crying out in pain. 
God entered our finite world, endured suffering, and died on the cross to rescue us. And he stands as the ultimate evidence of his great love for us. In times of suffering, you might find yourself completely in darkness, unsure of the reasons behind your pain, not understanding why you're going through suffering. <laughs> and the theology of suffering is so mysterious, so profound, that sometimes we will never get to know the reasons behind it. Sometimes God conceals it, hides it from us. But in the midst of this uncertainty, the cross offers answer on what the reason is not. It cannot be that God doesn't love you. It cannot be that he has no plan for you or that he has left you in the dark. No, Jesus <laughs> voluntarily sunk in that darkness, was forsaken and was separated and paid for our sins so that God the Father would never abandon you. The cross is the clear evidence of his love for you and his understanding of what it means to suffer. It shows that God can be at work in your life, even when it seems like there's no clear explanation for what is happening. Our Lord not only died the death we should have died, but he also lived the kind of life we were supposed to live, but couldn't. He was perfectly obedient. He did it for us. And it doesn't matter who you are, whether you're a centurion, person with a difficult past, someone who has made wrong choices, or even a person like myself serving in ministry, the curtain separated us from God has been torn from top to bottom. The barrier is gone. Now forgiveness and grace are right there waiting for you. Let's pray together. As we deeply ponder upon the cross where his love and mercy flow out, let us think about this message here. That we dare not to approach his throne, we couldn't because of his perfect holiness. But the curtain is now wide open. And we have this, we don't know how much privilege we have just to come to his presence every Sunday morning, to worship him face to face. It's possible because the curtain is torn apart, the barrier is gone, and the access to the throne of God is now open to all. Many times we take it for granted what it means to come into the presence of God to worship Him. And since this curtain is gone, now we can invite the others to this place to draw near to the throne of grace. That is our responsibility to make disciples of all nations our great commission of God. And to fulfill the great commission, we must first be faithful disciples of Jesus Christ who honor His Word, applying His Word in our everyday life, following in His footsteps. And we go out to the community, to the world, as ambassadors of Jesus Christ to proclaim the message that the curtain is wide open, you can now draw near to the throne of grace. We have this immense responsibility, each and every one of us, to invite the people to the throne of God. So let's pray at this time, thanking God for what He has done, and for us to draw near to Him now. And now we have that this responsibility. Let's pray together.
Our Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your great mercy and love. Lord, many times we do not understand the gravity, what it means to come into the presence of God in this holy sanctuary to worship you, Lord. Worship is our greatest priority, but it is also our greatest privilege. And blessing. Lord, help us to always remember that. Lord, may our life be an act of worship. Lord, may we be ambassadors of Jesus Christ, going out to the world, declaring of your beauty, your grace and love for us, declaring that the curtain is torn apart, the barrier is gone. Now you are free to enter into the throne of mercy. Lord, help us to be the faithful disciples of Jesus Christ who fulfills that, the divine role of Great Commission. Lord, I pray that your holy presence will burst from this holy of holies, touching the hearts of everyone's life, those who are going through pain, suffering, affliction, worries, concerns, that you would burst out from that presence, that you would touch the heart, just like you have touched the Roman century of. Penetrate through our hearts, pierce through our hearts. To receive the perfect comfort and encouragement and peace that comes from you. Lord, we thank you and we praise you. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. <clears throat> At this time, let's stand as we are able to sing our last song, Above All. <clears throat>
Father, as we conclude this time of worship and, re and reflection on the sacrifice of your Son, Jesus Christ, we stand in awe of the darkness that signified your judgment, the tearing of the curtain that opened the way to your presence, and the centuries' confession acknowledging Jesus as the Son of God. We pray that the darkness of our past, darkness of our present, be dispelled by the light of your grace. And may the torn curtain remind us that we can boldly approach your throne with confidence. As we step out into the world, may we carry this truth and message with us, sharing this message of transformation with those around us, inviting and drawing the people to the throne of grace. I pray in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.